There being five ayes, 34 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. I'll ask senators to quietly depart. That concludes formal business, unless you are participating in the urgency motion. And I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 25 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Rice proposing a matter of urgency be chosen. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Uh, I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I will give the call and I'll ask senators to quietly leave the chamber and I'll give the call to Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President. And could you formally move the matter of urgency? Yeah, oh, yes. Um, I formally move that the Senate notes the urgency motion by Senator Ross. Please, um, that in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. The mining and burning of coal, oil and gas is the primary cause of global heating and is causing more frequent and more intense floods, heat waves, fires, and that to protect lives and livelihoods, no new coal, oil and gas projects should be started in Australia. Mr President, don't take my word for this. This is what the science tells us. This is what the IPCC panel of climate change experts, a couple of hundred of the world's most eminent climate scientists, tells us. It tells us that on our current trajectory, our business as usual scenarios, this planet is on a three to four degree warming trajectory this century. Entire parts of our Earth, our home, will be uninhabitable at a three to four degree warming scenario, not just because of drought and lack of rainfall, pests and diseases, but also because of extreme weather events. And when we think of extreme weather events, like the bushfires this country witnessed just two years ago, or the floods, the unprecedented floods we've seen on the eastern seaboard in recent weeks, but also in the oceans, the unprecedented heat waves we are seeing in the ocean that are destroying our beautiful and globally significant coral reefs, our seagrass beds right around the country, our giant kelp forests, changes in the ocean that have profound, profound impacts on Australian communities right around this country, and on the farming community who rely for their livelihood, and we all rely on the food that they grow. No one is more vulnerable than they are as an industry to our changing climate and to global warming. And the sole thing we can do, the most important thing we can do to reduce our emissions targets, our 2030 emissions targets in particular, is to stop all new oil and gas production all new fossil fuel production in this country. But once again, don't take my word for that. Listen to the International Energy Agency, who said that 2021 was the year that we needed to leave all new fossil fuels in the ground and transition as rapidly as possible to 100 per cent renewables. But what do we do? What do we get from this government? Just today, we found that Mr Angus Taylor, the so-called Minister for Emissions Reductions, is bringing before the parliament regulations to give more public money to a fossil fuel project. They have given hundreds of millions of dollars in grants to fossil fuel projects at a time 
when we know we've got to be transitioning away from fossil fuels. Every time I talk to people about climate change, every time this issue is raised with me as a senator, whether it's with uh, Green supporters, whether it's with Labor supporters, whether it's with Liberal supporters, it doesn't matter. Every person I speak to, I highlight them the simple fact that climate change is actually not first and foremost an environmental problem, nor is it an economic problem, even though it's caused by business activity, unregulated externalities from business activities. It is a first and foremost a political problem. Only politics can solve this. People can change their behaviour. That makes a difference. But it is a systemic issue that this place, this parliament, can help solve. We have more reasons than most to show global leadership on taking the climate action necessary to limit emissions and warming to 1.5 degree above pre-industrial levels. But what do we do? We do the exact opposite. We are a global embarrassment. We have been called out by the UN, by UNESCO, by countries all around the world, including our friends and allies like the United States, as being a global embarrassment on climate change. Not only a laggard, but we are deliberately undermining climate action because this politics in this place, the Labor and Liberal Party, are captured by fossil fuel interests. That's the problem. Until we clean up politics, we'll never fix it. So this issue has to be first and foremost on the minds of Australians when they go into their polling booth. They need to vote for climate action. They need to vote Greens. Uh, Senator McMahon. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on this matter of urgency from the Greens. As always, the Greens over-exaggerate on climate change for their selfish political purposes. It is disgraceful, absolutely disgraceful, to politicise recent natural disasters and tragedies trying to political point score on the back of human misery and suffering. Shame, shame on you. Shame on you for doing that. That is just terrible. Um, if, we look, if we look at some of the claims that the Greens are trying to push, uh, they've, they're claiming that climate change has caused the flooding that we've seen recently in eastern Australia. These claims just simply do not stack up. Um, the CSIRO, in their Climate Change in Australia report, showed that rainfall extremes in northern New South Wales have been only slightly above average, and for South East Queensland, they have been average. We have rainfall records to back this up. The Brisbane River, for example, experienced a major flood last month, but there have been 10 floods that have been greater over the past 150 years. In fact, uh, dangerous floods have occurred in every Australian state over the last 150 years. And we can, we can name some of them. 19, uh, 1852, Gundagai in New South Wales. Uh, 1916, Claremont in Queensland. Uh, 1934, Melbourne. 1893, Ipswich, Queensland. 1927, Brisbane, Cairns, Townsville in Queensland. Uh, that, that 1927 flood, 47 deaths, 16 homes destroyed, an estimated £300,000 in damages. Uh, this was at a time when our population and value of property destroyed were far lower than they are today. Can you imagine the effects of that flood? today. So, and these are going back over 100 years, these floods. These are not a new phenomenon, as the Greens would have you believe. Now, if we talk about bushfires, the CSIR, CSIRO admits that there is no evidence linking climate change with, with bushfires at this stage. 
as they state in their Climate Change in Australia report. No studies explicitly attributing the Australian increase in fire weather to climate change have been performed at this time. Yet the Greens shockingly try and blame um, government policies on the deaths and destruction of property in fires. Now, all these, all these events are, are tragedies. I mean, it's a tragedy for someone to lose their life, their home, their livestock, their pets in, in floods or fires. And we shouldn't be politicising and trying to score cheap points on the back of these tragedies. Um, but not, not all tragedies have an actual human cause that you can point the finger at someone and say, you did this. Um, the Greens try to. They point to the Prime Minister and, uh, and say, you did this. And that, that is just absolutely ridiculous. These are natural weather events. We have been having floods, fires, tsunamis, um, hurricanes, cyclones uh, for you know, as long as we've got records. And we can even point to these back before we had records. Now, if, um, if the Greens' outrageous claims were true, and, um, but they're not, they're absolutely not true, but if, they were, if, if we pretend for a second that they're true, their attempt to pin the blame on Australia for these outcomes is completely ridiculous and absurd. If we just have a look at what Australia does produce, we produce 6 per cent of the world's coal production, 3.7 per cent of the world's gas production, and 0.6 per cent of the world's oil production. Even if Australia were to shut down all our coal, oil and gas tomorrow, it would make no difference to the temperature of the globe or any of the natural disasters that the Greens are trying to pin on it. Um, now, if we look at uh, carbon dioxide emissions by country, China accounts for 29 per cent, USA 14 per cent, India 7 per cent, Russia 4.5 per cent, Japan 3.4, Germany 2 per cent and Australia 1.1 per cent. In 2020, China emitted 13.8 gigatons of carbon dioxide and equivalent greenhouse gases. By comparison, Australia emitted 512 megatons. That's roughly 27 times less than China. In 2021, China was running 1,058 coal-fired power plants. That is more than half, half the world's capacity. China's emissions have more than tripled over the pe previous three decades. They emit more greenhouse gas than the entire developed world combined. Yet the Greens want us to wreck our economy, to wreck our way of life uh, for the, the massive 1.1 per cent that we contribute. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do our bit in reducing all types of pollution, um, you know, and I'm, I'm not just concerned about, uh, you know, global warming, climate change. Uh, we've got a lot of other things to worry about, such as plastics in our ocean. You know, maybe the Greens could show a little bit of care for our oceans instead of banging on about what Australia does um, to the world's climate. Um, I can tell you that our little milly fluff of a percentage of emissions is not going to do a damn thing, even if we cut it to zero, to the effects of greenhouse gases on the world's climate. And as we can see from what's happening in Europe today, if Australia would stop mining coal, oil and gas, we would only strengthen countries like Russia that threaten to bully and are invading and killing their neighbours. Uh, Europe is currently paying Russia more than $1 billion a day for coal, oil and gas. Europe has re reduced its own gas production 
by 30 per cent over the past decade, while its consumption has decreased by less than 13 per cent. Europe has more gas reserves than Australia, so its extra reliance on Russian gas is completely self-inflicted. This is why, when Ukraine asked us for help, for us for help to fight Putin, this is why they asked us to send coal, not solar panels. Uh, Europe's dependent on Russian gas is partly because it has allowed Russian funding of anti-fossil fuel campaigns to remain unchecked. We have a lot of evidence that uh, Russian oligarchs are funding some of the um, anti-fossil fuel campaigners and the activist groups that are campa campaigning certainly overseas and even right here in Australia. Isn't it ironic that the Greens have a, a slightly well hidden, dirty little secret. Their campaigns are actually helped by the funding Putin provides to anti fossil fuel organisations. That's right, funded by Russia with love. Um, Senator Wish Wilson also talked about food. Well, if we look at food security, um, products of the oil and gas industries account for approximately 45 per cent of the world's fuel production, uh, food production. So um, you, we all know that, that urea, which is compo a composition of most of the fertilisers that we use in this world, um, comes from the oil and gas industry, that they want to stop. They want to stop this industry 45 per cent of the world's food production. So the Greens not only want us to freeze to death, they also want us to starve to death. And this will hurt the world's poorest nations. Uh, thank you, Senator. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today also to speak on the MPI that Senator Rice has put forth. And as most of us understand in this chamber, uh, but not all, I'm sad to say. Climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our time. In Australia, we have indeed seen its devastating impacts, which have increased over recent years and even months in tragic fires, floods, cyclones and more. Here in the Labor Party, we've always been committed to strong action on climate change. You saw that when we were last in government, and we committed to net zero by 2050, some seven years ago, which is, in Labor's view, an essential starting point. This is a goal that the CSIRO says will deliver higher wages and incomes, and also for Australians, lower power costs. Why? Because we know that renewable energy is, in fact, cheaper than bringing online uh, new coal or fossil fuel power. It's a goal that the University of Melbourne says will deliver 20 times greater benefit to the economy than any costs. It is a goal that is not only the right thing to do by future generations here in Australia and around the world, but it is also the right thing to do by our economic and social goals right now, today. But as the motion before us put forward by the Greens, which we don't support, um, seems to argue against, we need a real path to get there. We can't have passionate speeches. They're not worth much without discernible action and a real plan to get the job done. We want to see in our nation, and Labor has a plan for, job-creating investment, job-creating investment that delivers real emissions reduction. And this is a plan where we will need to bring the Australian people with us. 
I speak to many voters uh, in the course of the upcoming election about their desire to see real action on climate change. But I also speak to voters, the vast majority of voters, who aren't about to vote for a plan that's going to see them out of work and out of a job. That's why they have confidence in Labor's plan and Labor's approach on addressing action on climate change, because we know we can have a productive economic future and create a path to zero emissions by 2050. We are in the Labor Party the only party that has a medium term commitment to get us to 2050 with that zero emissions uh, outcome. Its impact on the economy is properly modelled. That is how you get sustainable, enduring and long-lasting action on climate change, not stunt motions here in the Senate. Australia has the potential to become one of the world's renewable energy superpowers, but only if we have the leadership and vision needed to bring Australia together to seize the opportunities in front of us. This can't be about wedge stunts. It has to be about a real path for jobs, and that includes the jobs that exist in our fossil fuel industries currently. The Greens fail to note in their motion the ob obvious truth that changing where countries buy their fossil fuels from doesn't reduce global emissions one bit. We've seen this happen before with much of the offshoring that's already happened in Australia. We've seen jobs go offshore to countries with dirtier fuels, lower safety standards and lower labour standards. So we don't support the motion that's before us today, but what we do support is a strong plan, and Labor's put forward this strong plan that will deliver $24 billion in public investment to Australia's efforts to address climate change and energy transformation. Energy transformation of um, our coal and gas powered uh, electricity generation here in Australia. That public investment is absolutely critical to increasing the penetration of renewables in the electricity grid, and the independent modelling of Labor's plan shows that we can reach 82 per cent penetration of uh, that uh, uh, production of energy by 2030. That is 82 per cent of our world's nation's electricity by 2030 will be renewable. We know that this transformation is already happening. Renewables and storage are already the cheapest form of new energy. We know that the international, the international outlook for coal is becoming uh, more constrained. And are ultimately the market and a commitment to global action will be the decider of timing of fossil fuel exits. But I have to say, the market is already deciding. 80 per cent of global GDP is already decarbonising. This has serious implications for our resources sector in coming years, and we will be here to support the sector to reorganise itself to create the jobs of tomorrow. We've got more than 140 countries worldwide signed up to the NZE 2050. But this government, Prime Minister Scott Morrison and his National Party buddies, like to pretend that the world won't change. They've got their heads well and truly in the sand. But the simple fact is, and Labor knows this, and we know that the Greens know it already, but they have to find a deeper way of politicising this to wedge the Labor Party. The Greens know 
Labor knows, business knows, Australians already know that global capital is already moving. So here with Prime Minister Morrison, we have yet again a man without a plan, a Prime Minister without a vision and a path to get us to the future, get us to that better future that we all as Australians deserve. There hasn't been a new coal-fired power station built in Australia since 2009. And given how renewable energy generation is now, has now become dominant since then, the Labor Party doesn't see that changing. The Greens would have Australia exit coal and gas tomorrow, exit coal and gas, but with no plan for workers, communities or our energy system. We are making those plans for that transition. The government tries to use taxpayer funds for coal-fired power stations that the market won't even touch. And Labor knows that this exposes taxpayers to a massive carbon liability. So here we are, with clowns to the left and jokers to the right, we have an opportunity here for solid, stable government that believes in real action on climate change. And we will have that opportunity before us at the next election. So we're confident in the way that we are taking our climate change policies out to the Australian people. They have strong support from business, strong support from environmental groups and strong support from the community. As we've seen uh, in the last two months alone, the closures of three coal-fired power stations have in our country been brought forward. And so with this election imminent, we're not here to uh, blame Scott Morrison and his energy minister for those closures. The fact is those closures have nothing to do with government policy. This is about the market operating. Pratt. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, all I can say is, here we go again. The Greens, Labor, Liberal, Nationals seem to think that science occurs when someone says the words, the science says. That is a lie. That is a delusion. A dangerous lie and a dangerous delusion. Empirical scientific evidence, measured observations, decide science when presented within a causal framework that proves cause and effect. The Greens never present empirical scientific evidence showing cause and effect. So let's assess each of the Greens' statements and implied claims and the empirical scientific evidence that actually exist. Their first claim, global heating. Global atmosphere has not warmed since 1995 especially when you include analysis of natural El Nino cycles. No increase for 27 years. The longest temperature trend in the last 140 years has been 40 years from 1936 to 1976. 40 years of cooling. It was warmer by far in Australia in the 1890s and 1890s. I said 1880s and 1890s, far warmer than today. Today is now cooler than 97% of the Holocene. That period of, of uh, Earth's history is the last 10,000 years since the last glaciers. No heating. That's the end of the story. No heating. End of story. But let's continue. They, they make a statement, the burning of coal, oil and gas is the primary cause. Well, human use of hydrocarbon fuels leads to the production of water vapour, H2O, and carbon dioxide. Water vapour has a net cooling effect on the planet. Human carbon dioxide is a plant food. It's essential for all life on this planet. It increases plant growth as it gets higher in the atmosphere. And it has a net cooling effect because of that on the, on the vegetation. 
Now, next question. Does human carbon dioxide affect the level of carbon dioxide in the air? That's fundamental. During the global financial crisis, we had, we had a natural experiment for the whole planet. We saw a 7 per cent reduction in the level of carbon dioxide produced by human activity, industrial and transportation activity, yet the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere continued to increase. So we cut our carbon dioxide and the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increased. In 2020, we had a second planetary experiment with the COVID restrictions. We had a bigger decrease in human carbon dioxide output, yet the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere continued to increase. Human production of carbon dioxide does not and cannot affect the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Full stop. Nature alone controls the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, regardless of what we do. Nature alone produces 32 times each year the level of carbon dioxide that we produce. Entire human activity is just one thirty-second of what nature produces. Nature produces 97 per cent of Earth's carbon dioxide every year. The oceans contain in dissolved form 50 to 70 times the carbon dioxide in Earth's entire atmosphere. Slight cooling in the ocean temperatures leads to absorption of carbon dioxide. Slight warming leads to release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Nature alone controls the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So let's have a look at some other statistics. Floods in Brisbane and South East Queensland. The last 100 years, 100, 100 years, two major floods. The previous 90 years, nine major floods. In 1893 and 1841, far higher than any recent flood. In 1893, in the summer, Brisbane endured three floods within three months. Tropical cyclones, there's been no increase. There's been a slight decrease or flat in frequency and severity. Fires, similarly, today's fires are far less than in the past. Heat waves, much shorter, much cooler than in the 1880s and 1890s. Don't believe me? Go and see the Bureau of Meteorology, Bureau of Meteorology data. Next, reef bleaching. It's natural. It's record cooling in the Southern Great Barrier Reef in June 2008 saw the coral bleaching due to record cooling. And it's caused by symbiosis in the corals. Who pays for these lies? The people of Australia, especially the poor. This is the Greens' lies are dishonest, treasonous Thank you, and Senator a betrayal Roberts. of Australia and Australians. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Antic. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, here we are again in Groundhog Day. More alarmist rhetoric from the Australian Greens who choose to take up the Senate's time moving a motion straight from the mouth of the child prophet of their climate cult, Greta Thunberg. A motion that is so out of step with the global crisis in Europe a motion that would destroy jobs, industries and livelihoods all across Australia, and particularly in regional Australia. And what is most concerning about this is we know that if the election goes the way of Labor, there's more to come. We know that because this will be the ransom of the Greens to support the Labor government. Every bill, every motion, every vote will depend on the Greens' support. Now, petrol prices have risen dramatically following the breakout of war in Ukraine, with petrol prices climbing from $160 per litre in December to over $2 in March 2022, and there doesn't appear to be any sign of it slowing any time soon. Former US President Donald Trump was absolutely right towards, to work towards making America energy independent. He understood that like relying on foreign powers like Russia, China and the Middle East was not a practical long-term option. These are nations that do not have our best interests, and they don't have the best interests of the West at heart. Their values are not compatible with ours, and they remain, to remain dependent on energy in which they are involved is dangerous. Here in Australia, we're blessed with natural resources—oil, coal, gas, uranium. We have the resources to ensure Australia is less dependent on foreign powers. So why don't we do it? Because we're continuing to pander to nonsense like this. The Green Left's obsession with climate change is making this country weak. They've failed to grasp the importance of ensuring Australia's energy independence, as well as ignoring the fact that drilling can actually be done safely, efficiently, and it ensures that we remain precariously it ensures that we don't remain precariously dependent on other nations for our energy security. This is the same Australian Greens, by the way, who have so little regard for this country that they stand on a defence policy platform which seeks to reduce our defence spending. 
a platform let's repeat that a platform which seeks to slash defence spending at a time where the prospects of conflict are rising every single day this is this is a policy platform listen to this senator thought you'll learn something which seeks global cooperation facilitated by peaceful non-violent conflict which states that non-violent conflict this is true this is straight from their website non-violent conflict resolution is the most effective way of promoting peace two fairly realistic prospects right there i can just see it if, they, if, if the Labor Party makes government, they'll make Adam Bant the foreign minister. They'll send him off. They'll send him off with his little hemp bag. They'll take him off and they'll take him down to see Putin. He'll sit there with Putin and Xi and they'll talk about peaceful solutions. It's hilarious. And when an unexpected crisis like Russia's invasion of Ukraine comes up, pressure's actually brought to bear on the international energy market. And it's Australian families who end up spending more on petrol and endure the tremendous financial strain. It's a matter that's lost on our friends across the chamber. That means Australians have less to spend on, on their groceries, less to spend on their, on their lifestyle, and it causes the economy, of course, to lag. And this is because, frankly, too many, too many in this place, too many in the community, are prepared to stand up to the petulant left. And one which this is a, this is a movement which has been telling us for the past 50 years that we're going to get a mass extinction episode in the next decade, one after the other. The Greens would rather have us dependent on China, Russia, and the Middle East than energy independent. Now, despite Norwegian company Equinor having sadly been forced to pull out of drilling in the Great Australian Bight, there will be others that will seek to do so, and we should be ensuring that we allow every possible opportunity for them to do so. Rather than shamefully celebrating the bullying of these projects out of town, these green left activists should put down the French champagne, turn off the Tesla and stand up for Aussie jobs. What's important is that the Australian government continues to ignore the voices of the radical left and encourages companies to explore and drill the bite, which could still be, if we make it so, Australia's North Sea. So let's be clear. I'm happy to call for drilling in the Great Australian Bight. It should be explored, it should be grill, drilled and it should be used safely for the greater Australian good. Not left on the shelf to aid and abet the phony crony capitalists in interests of our strategic foes like the Chinese Communist Party. Australians need to reject the false profits of green politics. And the same applies, by the way, to nuclear power. Because if the climate catastrophists are so concerned with carbon emissions, why not utilise an energy which is zero emission and energy efficient as a way of generating power, because the science tells us it's safe. Remember the science? Could it be that following the science is simply a rhetorical sleight of hand to bully those into not questioning their ideology? We've got to take this opportunity to make the most of, of those opportunities that living in this country affords us and be prepared for crises like what's happening in the Ukraine as they arise. We're blessed to live in this country. Its natural resources are plentiful. And yet we continue to ignore what's available on our doorstep to appease the climate cultists. And like Australia, the US is languishing under increased fuel prices due mainly to its energy dependence under President Biden, who could have kept the Keystone XL pipeline project alive, which would have seen almost a million barrels of oil carried from Canada to Nebraska in one single day. Construction of the pipeline had been revived by President Trump after being cancelled by Obama and then it was only to be cancelled by Biden again. And look what's happened. As usual, this kowtowing to the green left leaves the West and countries like the United States in far more vulnerable position for the non-existent greater good of fighting climate change, while they continue to completely ignore countries like China and India, which pollute far more than any Western country. And how often is the extreme left going to beat the drum of climate action in this country? No emissions reductions will ever satisfy them, because if they admit there's nothing more to talk about, they admit that Australia is doing its fair share, then their political relevance drops away. This country has, in fact, as we have said so many times in this, in this chamber before, both meet and beaten its 2020 targets. Emissions are 20 per cent below 2005 levels, which was the baseline for the Paris Agreement, and emissions have fallen faster than many other comparable advanced economies, outpacing reductions in the United States. The latest projections show Australia is on track to reduce emissions by 35 per cent by 2030. And yet it's still not enough. It'll never be enough. It's like green activists aren't actually interested in the environment, it's just their job-destroying ideology. The invasion of Ukraine has meant that Western nations are thoroughly distancing themselves from Russia, which has meant that a large portion of our oil must either be sourced from elsewhere or from inside our own borders. China has been spouting concerning rhetoric regarding Taiwan for some time now, and the day may soon arrive when there is an attempted invasion. 
We have to ensure that we're self-reliant. We have to ensure that we're not dependent on other countries whose values do not align with our own. And, we ha and it's time to stop pandering to the ideological left. There's no good reason for Australia not to be far more energy independent. If we prioritise our long-term national security, not to mention our economy and the well-being of the Australian family, then there's really no other option. So I say, let's start drilling the bite. Thank you, Senator Antic. Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to oppose this motion, uh, which is yet again another green stunt. Um, I suppose we are drawing the end of this parliamentary sitting, and every week of this parliamentary sitting has been characterised by green stunts, so why would anything uh, change now as this parliament comes to an end? Climate change is a real issue. Uh, we are feeling it, we are seeing it, we are experiencing it every day uh, right now. Um, as we speak, uh, northern New South Wales is flooding again. Uh, South East Queensland has had heavy rainfall. We see heat waves, we see bushfires more often and uh, of more intensity. And all of the scientists tell us that uh, unless if we take serious action on climate change, the situation will get worse with more natural disasters more frequently and more intensely. So climate change is a real issue and it is one that the parliament should take seriously and it is one that as a country we should take action uh, on. But the way to deal with it is through a real plan that has been thought through, that has been costed, that has mod been modelled, uh, which establishes exactly what needs to be done in the most effective, most efficient way. And that is the plan that Labor has put forward. Um, Labor has put forward a comprehensive plan as opposed to the Greens putting forward a three-line motion. That's the extent of the Greens' plans for, deal with, to, for dealing with the very real chain, uh, uh, challenge that we have around climate change. So it is only Labor that has a real plan to deal with the challenge of climate change. On the one hand, uh, we have the government, which doesn't even believe in climate change if you just scratch below the surface. We have had a lost decade under this government of action on climate change, where we've seen temperatures increase, we've seen sea levels rise, we've seen natural disasters become more frequent and more intense, with no action and simply denial from this government about the need to do anything. And finally, when they were dragged kicking and screaming to committing to net zero emissions by 2050, all they had to back it up was a flimsy booklet marketing man style from the Prime Minister, uh, which relies on technology that has not even been invented yet as its way of getting to net zero by 20, uh, 2050. Their policy is a complete joke. Uh, it has more holes in it than a piece of, piece of Swiss cheese. And the reason for that is that they don't fundamentally believe that climate change is a real risk. What they do believe is that they are now in danger of losing seats, particularly to independents in, in Sydney and Melbourne. That is the only thing that has prompted the government to even come up with a flimsy booklet that relies on technology that has not yet been existed. So that's the government's position. And on the other side, we have the Greens, who argue that we should and can exit the use of coal and gas tomorrow. And that's what this motion goes to. They have no plan for the workers who would be affected by that. They have no plan for what that means for the energy grid. They don't recognise um, that until we do have renewables at scale, we will continue to need coal and gas to back up our electricity system. That's just a reality. Um, and unfortunately, the Greens are denying that reality. They, and they, they have no plan for what happens to workers, the energy grid, or people's ongoing need to use electricity. It, it also, the Greens' plan, does nothing about the fact that other countries continue to consume coal and gas, continue to mine it, continue to supply it and continue to use it. Um, so even if we did follow the Greens' motion, it would do absolutely nothing about the rest of the world's use of coal and gas uh, and, in fact, would probably see uh, dirtier resources being used rather than those that are produced in Australia. So in contrast to both the Greens and the LNP, Labor is the only party that is taking a real plan to deal with climate change to the coming election. Our Powering the Nation uh, policy, which we launched at the end of last year, uh, will create jobs, it will cut emissions and it will cut power prices. They are the things that we need to do as a country, both to tackle the economic challenge that we have 
uh, around our future energy sources. And that is the policy that will deliver real change and real action on climate change, not stunts like this from the Greens Party, uh, three, three, three sentence or, or three line motions that will do nothing to actually fix these problems, that won't deliver cheaper power, that won't reduce emissions, and certainly won't look after people's jobs. So, you know, I'd encourage the Greens to reflect on their behaviour and the way they approach this issue. This is a significant issue. It deserves a well thought through plan, and that is not what the Greens are offering us. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I've just come back from Larrakia country, Darwin, where I listened to and sat with around 40 traditional owners, senior law people and Jungais. They told me to give you this message. We need all of the governments to listen to us. We don't want no fracking in the Beetaloo. This is our land, our future, our water, our life. Auntie Nancy McDinney told me to tell you fellas to actually go to Borolula, go drink their water, live like they live, and go and give them what they need because none of you have. You all talk about it in here. None of you have been there. You get to sit here and make decisions for country you don't know and could never know or understand. Traditional owners do not want fracking. Not now, not ever. Some of you probably have Auntie Nancy's paintings in your offices. But when it comes to actually listening to what she wants for country and community, you're all of a sudden not interested. But you'll rave and rant about your dot paintings, I'm sure. Do not frack the Northern Territory. We also heard how the Northern Land Council is helping these mining companies like Santos and Origin destroy country and water. Both these companies had to be summoned to attend a separate hearing because they flat out refused to look traditional owners in the eyes in Darwin. Shame. Shame. Traditional owners told us that the Northern Land Council just refuses to hear the word no. Traditional owners have time and time again said no to fracking. No to destruction of country and heritage. No to the poisoning of water. The Northern Land Council is complicit in the lies that gas companies are telling our people. What's worse is that the NLC is meant to be protecting country and working with traditional owners. It's absolutely shameful and disgraceful and disrespectful. And the sooner that this parliament investigates the dodgy dealings of these land councils, the better. I say to these dodgy land councils, I'm watching you. Our people are watching you and we are coming. You are on notice. In conclusion, I would like to thank my colleague Senator Cox and Senator McCarthy, who sat with traditional owners, who were part of the story, who were part of listening, and how powerful it was to see three deadly, staunch black women senators sitting in front of them, genuinely listening to what they had to say and genuinely taking on their fight and their voice and bringing it into this place. Thank you, my sisters. Don't frack the Northern Territory. Respect the traditional owners. And again, if you have a dot painting in your office that you admire each day and you tell your family and your friends about, then maybe look at the story of that dot pointing, that dot painting. Because you're killing the people 
who painted them. You're killing the land of the people who painted them. You're taking their children and you're doing all you can to destroy everything that they are and everything that their country means to them. Give up your dot point paintings or don't frack the NT. It's pretty simple. So I urge all of you senators with the dot paintings to go back, have a look at them. If you don't take it down, I hope they haunt you. Senator Ayres. Well, if the Greens political party is going to treat this chamber like a sort of youth model United Nations, I'd, I'd prefer it if the, re if the motions were a little bit more interesting and original. Is nothing if not predictable. We got the we got the usual thundering speech. We got the usual thundering speech at the beginning from the barefoot investor, which is good for the social media posts. I get it, but it is a tired contribution from a party that looks and sounds exhausted. They have been in this Senate for 34 long years, and this is all that they have, and a record of zero achievement. A few decades ago, I suppose there was at least some energy to them. Perhaps they had enough of the old activists still around to put some fuel in their ideological tank. Instead, the party of protest has become the party of performance art and street theatre. They have lost their ambition. They have lost their drive. Now, this is all just about securing the little 10 per cent that each of them need to come back here. It keeps them occupied, I suppose. It's going to get better. Um, to turn to the substance of the motion, to turn to the substance of this motion, although substance is an optimistic assessment of what we have before us, Labor won't be supporting it. But that's a foregone conclusion. It was written so that Labor would oppose it. That's what it was for. So the Greens have something to share on social media, so they can continue to justify their position in this chamber. The Greens aren't actually talking to the communities that actually have to live with the consequences of their ideas. The Labor Party is the only political party in this country that's capable of enacting real action on climate change, because we actually come from those communities. Consider Labor's candidate for the Hunter, Dan Repicholi, who actually works in the mining industry. Dan Repicholi has a more sophisticated understanding of climate change and what action on climate change means for the Australian energy system than the entire Greens caucus combined, because he lives it, because it's his workmates and his family and his community who are in the middle of this debate. And as a future member for the Hunter, he will continue to fight for them and he'll continue their to fight for their future instead of treating this like a debating society. Now, I understand that it's attractive to have a fight between the Greens and the citizen scientists over here. You know, poor old Senator Roberts and now Senator Antic and some of these other characters who sit at home and twiddle the dials and fill out their own spreadsheets and try and work out what's really going on because the scientists must be, you know, conning them. Poor old Senator Roberts does it on the vaccines too. Well, actually, there is a more serious issue here. It's a more serious issue that goes to the heart of how this country is going to deal with the failure of the last decade, the climate conflicts of the last decade that have left us stone cold motherless last, instead of leading in the world on these questions. Now, you know there is an alternative strategy. There is an alternative plan. Uh, there is an alternative strategy and there is an alternative plan. And you know what people should do? They should get behind it. You know, this resolution comes as the floodwaters are working their way through the Richmond River and Wilson River systems in Lismore. And families are once again facing up to the consequences there. We should not be ambulance chasing about these issues. We should be solving problems. After 34 long years, we've got to do better than this. There is an alternative plan, the Albanese Labor Plan. 
$24 billion of public investment, a fully costed plan, the most costed, effectively costed plan from an opposition in Australian political history, 604,000 jobs, five out of six of those jobs in the regions. By 2030, 82 per cent of the electricity grid from renewable sources. Power prices down, guaranteed. 43 per cent target by 2030. Net zero by 2050. A pathway to get there. Investment in manufacturing. Now, look, you can choose. My view is people ought to get behind a plan that could actually work. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to this MPU calling for a moratorium on new coal, oil and gas projects. We are in a climate crisis. There is no way around this, and coal and gas are the leading causes of climate change. This is not just the opinion of the Australian Greens. This is actually detailed in the IPCC report. The science is perfectly clear and every tonne of coal and gas burnt increases the intensity and the speed of the changes to the climate. Across Australia, there is a climate crisis. It's caused by mining and the burning of coal and gas. The continued mining and burning of coal and gas is causing more frequent floods, heat waves, and bushfires that we are watching in real time. And unfortunately, it's costing lives. In my home state of Western Australia, we know this all too well. Over the summer, we experienced record breaking heat waves and devastating bushfires. Those heat waves were both in Perth and in the Pilbara region. And we watched those bushfires in real time in the southwest. Parts of this beautiful country are now becoming unlivable due to the extreme temperatures. And, and I wish there were other senators that would have hung around for this detail. Because in Fitzroy Crossing in Western Australia, currently they experience 67 days over 40 degrees per year. If we are to stay on track with both the government and the opposition's policies, by 2050 they will be experiencing 155 days over 40 degrees, which is basically unlivable. We need real climate action now. We need real climate action, meaning phasing out coal and gas by 2030 and keeping climate-destroying coal and gas in the ground where it belongs. Real climate action means banning new coal and gas projects and stopping the gaslighting that is happening the narrative, the false narrative that is being created by this government. Real climate action means protecting our environment for future generations, both mine and yours. So what the burning question here is what's stopping Liberals and Labor from taking action on climate change? Well, it's no secret that both the Liberals and Labor take millions of dollars of donations from coal and gas billionaires and big corporations. So this is for the folks out there watching. The Australian public, in fact, every budget, the government slips into the books more billions of your taxes earmarked for coal and gas corporations. From these tax breaks that they give to those billionaires and big corporations, they give handouts. They spend public money on making the greatest challenge that we face far worse by backing more coal and gas projects across this country. So you won't hear Labor criticise the Liberals' fossil fuel handouts, which is why it means only putting the Greens in the balance of power will stop pouring more fuel onto the climate fire. Dirty donations explain why the Labor Party is also giving the green light to climate wrecking projects like the one that's operating in my backyard in Western Australia, the Scarborough Project, on the lands of the Maroochydore people. The Scarborough Gas Project is a climate bomb and will create pollution that equals 15 coal-fired power stations every single year, and it's worse than Adani. In fact, it will be like Jukun 2.0. Now, this federal government and the state governments included claim that major oil and gas projects like Scarborough will create jobs. But what they won't tell you is that in WA, their workforce 
um, in fact, does not create jobs for West Australians. They are better off literally supporting any, under, ever, any, any other industry because it is less than 1 per cent of WA's workforce. Political capture by the big coal and gas corporations through donations, through that revolving door of lobbyists and through job offers, their well-funded disinformation campaigns continue to see the Labor and Liberal parties throw money at their incumbent fossil fuel companies, all at the expense of slowing down that ever-present transition that we need to make. I'm proud to be from the only party who doesn't take money from the fossil fuel industry or big corporations because we won't take money from the Woodsides, the Rio Tintos of this world. The Greens have a plan for real action on climate change, but the only way we can do that is to kick the Liberals out and to push Labor, a Labor government further and faster on climate action, and it's a vote one for the Greens. A small change in a vote can put the Greens into shared power again so we can push Labor to go further and faster on tackling the climate crisis yeah, yeah. and making those billionaires and big corporations pay their fair share of tax so that we can get money back into our community services where it's needed. The shared power, in shared power, we can tackle the climate crisis, creating hundreds of thousands of jobs and making those corporations pay their fair share of tax so we can create a safer future for all of us. We can power a clean energy revolution that, again, will create all of those long-term jobs, enabling our workers in fossil fuel industries to transition away from polluting industries. We know Thank the you, Labor Senator Cox. Party— Thank you, Senator Cox. Uh, the time uh, for this item has expired, and the question uh, now is that the motion moved by Senator Rice be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Is, is a division required? Uh, a division is required. Uh, ring the bells.
Lock the doors. So the question is that uh, arising out of the urgency motion that the eyes should go to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Kim as teller for the eyes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the nose. Uh, order, there being eight ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. <laughs> 